alleged to have taken place in 2021 uh, while he was serving in the armed forces. As you, Madam Deputy Speaker, have already indicated, the House will understand that while there is a live criminal investigation in progress, there are limits on what I can properly say. Daniel Khalif will be caught in due course and will face a trial. Nothing should be said in this House or elsewhere that might prejudice those proceedings. So let me assist the House with what I can say. At approximately 7.30 yesterday morning, a vehicle which had made a delivery to the prison's kitchen left HMP Wandsworth. Shortly afterwards, local contingency plans for an unaccounted prisoner were activated, and in line with standard procedure, the police were informed. The prison was put into a state of lockdown while staff attempted to determine Daniel Khalif's whereabouts. The vehicle was stopped and searched by police after the alert was raised. Strapping was found underneath the vehicle, which appeared to indicate that Daniel Khalif may have held onto the underside of it in order to escape. The search is underway. His Majesty's Prison and Probation Service are giving every assistance to the Metropolitan Police's operation to recapture Daniel Khalif and return him to custody. As has been made clear by the Metropolitan Police, there is no reason to believe he poses a threat to the wider public. Yesterday, when I was first briefed on this grave security breach, I spoke to the Governor of HMP Wandsworth and senior HMPPS leaders to establish what was known about the escape and seek assurances about the immediate measures being taken to ensure the security of the prison. I made clear then, and I reiterate now, that no stone must be left unturned in getting to the bottom of what happened. Who was on duty that morning? In what roles? Ranging from the kitchen to the prison gate, what protocols were in place? Were they followed? Second, I have ordered an investigation into the categorisation decision by HMPPS. Were all relevant matters taken into consideration in determining where in the custodial estate Daniel Khalif should be held? In both cases, I have asked for the preliminary findings to be with me by the end of this week, and an assessment will be made then about what can properly be put into the public domain. I have also decided there will need to be an additional independent investigation into this incident, and that will take place in due course. I want to turn, Madam Deputy Speaker, to the wider prisoner cohort held by HMPPS. In light of these events, I have ordered two urgent reviews. First, into the placement and categorisation of everyone held in HMP Wandsworth, and second, into the location of all those in the custodial estate charged with terrorism offences. Let me turn now to the issue of prison security. As the House will no doubt be aware, escapes from prison are extremely rare, and their numbers have declined substantially in the last 10 to 15 years. This has been due in considerable part to sustained investment in improved physical and intelligence security. That includes investment of £100 million in the period since 2019 on measures such as enhanced gate security with X-ray body scanners, which has driven up the fines of drugs, weapons and other contraband, including tools that could be used to aid in escape from prison. HMPPS has also enhanced intelligence and anti-corruption operations in prison, working more closely than ever with partners including the intelligence agencies. This has involved productive initiatives such as setting up the joint counter-terrorism prisons and probation hub. Madam Deputy Speaker, Daniel Khalif will be found and he will be made to face justice. I commend the statement to the House. Shadow Secretary of State, Shibana Mamou. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of his statement. And I would like to reiterate our support for the police and all of those who are involved in the search to recapture Daniel Halife. And I very much hope that uh, that search will be brought to a swift and successful conclusion so that the rest of the legal process uh, may take place. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is an extreme extremely serious matter and it has highlighted catastrophic and multiple failures not just in respect of this case but of our wider criminal justice system. It simply beggars belief that a man being held on suspected terror charges was able to escape a prison by clinging to the bottom of a food delivery van. The simplest question for the Justice Secretary today is how on earth was this allowed to happen? How is such an escape even 
possible, and nothing that he has said to the House today so far gets us remotely close to a full answer to this central question. Now, I know he will say when he responds to me that it is early days, that he has ordered uh, the relevant investigations, and they, they must have some time to conclude. But with respect, Madam Deputy Speaker, it gives me no confidence that the Secretary of State has today arrived with a list of very basic questions that, frankly, he should already know some of the answers to and be able to share with the House uh, today. Uh, I note with complete agreement uh, both what he says and your direction, Madam Deputy Speaker, that nothing must be said either in the chamber or indeed anywhere else that may prejudice any future trial or indeed the live uh, operation that is currently underway. But the circumstances and the facts of the escape itself are a separate matter that, is of, that it is of legitimate and urgent concern to this House and also to the wider uh, public, and that is separate uh, from the nature of any and all charges that will form the basis of future trials or other uh, investigations. And really, the Justice Secretary does need to give much fuller answers to the House today rather than a list of his own questions. And so on the circumstances of the uh, escape itself, can he at least tell the House when he responds how many staff were on duty at Wandsworth Prison uh, yesterday? Is he confident and can he tell us that all of the relevant searches uh, were done and where there are failures? perhaps the number of protocols that he is uh, concerned may have uh, been breached. Will his uh, investigations assess the quality of the training and the experience uh, of prison staff uh, at HMP uh, Wandsworth? And will he be bringing in any additional expertise to assist with those matters uh, whilst he is uh, getting on top uh, of the facts uh, himself? In respect of the categorisation uh, of this particular uh, prisoner, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, why was a suspected uh, terror offender held at a Category B uh, jail whilst on remand, despite many other suspected and indeed convicted terrorists being held in the high security uh, estate? Why was Daniel Khalife moved from Belmarsh to Wandsworth? And can you at least tell us whether a risk assessment uh, before any such move took place was undertaken? That is at least a yes or a no uh, answer. Uh, can you tell us how many similar suspects are in Category B or indeed at HMP uh, Wandsworth, and what is the timescale uh, for such uh, an assessment? Um, in relation to uh, the two urgent reviews, uh, may I say to him, with respect, it should be a relatively short exercise to get across the detail and the, the total number uh, of the current prison population at Wandsworth, and the fact that the Justice Secretary has not come to the House uh, with even that small amount of detail, I think uh, I do have to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, is unacceptable. Uh, on the issue of the location of all of those charged with terror offences, can you tell us the total number uh, of the individuals that are being uh, considered uh, in this category uh, as of today across the whole uh, of the prison estate? Uh, when will that urgent review of those numbers, uh, and I hope he can share the total number, when will that urgent review uh, take place? And I accept he cannot share any details, but does he know the number uh, of individuals that might be of concern and who may need to be moved uh, to a different location, given the events uh, of yesterday? On the broader investigation, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I note the Secretary of State has ordered a fuller investigation. Can he say anything today in his response to me in relation to the terms of reference uh, for such an investigation? What does he envisage uh, for the timescale uh, for that longer, uh, fuller investigation? Uh, and on the matter of independence, can he give us some reassurance as to uh, whether uh, he will make sure that uh, it won't be a case of him and others who are responsible ultimately for this failure marking their own homework? What, what, what consideration is he given to the independence and the identity of who might be carrying out that investigation uh, for him? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the developments of the last 24 hours have shown us yet another example of the Conservative mismanagement, which has meant that they are unable to run vast swathes of the public realm, whether it be schools threatening our children's education and their learning, or now with a terror suspect on the loose. Ultimately, one of the main functions of government is to keep its citizens safe. And on his watch, Madam Deputy Speaker, courts are in crisis, probation is in crisis, the CPS is in crisis, and prisons are in crisis. So finally, when will the Secretary of State get a grip? Yeah.
Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I begin by welcoming uh, the Right Honourable Lady to her place. So uh, I will try and address the, uh, the points that she raises. First of all, it is important to note, and I was pleased to hear her remarks about not wanting to prejudice a future trial, escape is a criminal offence. So we do need to keep that uh, in mind. Uh, she asks about whether there will be uh, inquiries into staff on duty, the quality of training. Absolutely. That's precisely what I have uh, asked to take place. She asks about whether there's additional expertise in place. Yes, uh, that's already in place in Wandsworth at the moment, assisting with the investigation. But as I indicated in my opening remarks, I want to know who was on duty in the kitchens, who was on duty at the gate, what was the protocol that was in place, was it uh, applied, and if it wasn't applied, why wasn't it applied? These are all the questions that I've asked, and uh, she can be assured that they will be answered. On timing, I've already indicated that I want to have the preliminary answers on my desk by the end of this week, and I will then be able to make a decision considering all the relevant uh, uh, information about what can be put into the public domain. But we have to proceed carefully and on the basis of the evidence, and I say that because she raised a question which was factually incorrect. She said, why was he moved from Belmarsh? He was never in Belmarsh. And with respect, it is important, it is important that we don't proceed on the basis of misinformation. So I, I can make that point uh, clear. So I, I absolutely understand the proper public interest and the proper points that are being raised, that's fine. But if she needs to raise any, ask any questions to me on matters of detail, she has my number, she can call. Uh, so let me say uh, also, uh, on the issue of who is held in a category, on the Category B estate, that is exactly what I have asked uh, the inquiry that I have asked to take place. In respect of Wandsworth, I think perhaps she's, um, no, I mean, no, no discourtesy, I think she may have misunderstood what I was suggesting by means of an inquiry. It's not an inquiry into the number of prisoners in Wandsworth, that's a matter of public record. It's about are the right people in Wandsworth? And are those Wandsworth prisoners, should they be there or should they be elsewhere? That is what needs to be uh, answered. Uh, as for the independence of the investigation, of course that's right, and that's, why it, it, that's precisely why I've ordered it. Um, so in, in summary, the position is this. This is a grave incident. She's right about that. The plenty of points she raises are perfectly legitimate, and we will get answers as quickly as possible. But we do need to proceed on the basis of the evidence coolly and calmly, so that when he's called, as he will be, he will be brought to justice and justice will be done. Chair of the Justice Select Committee, Sir Robert Neill. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Secretary of State for the, the statement and for his courtesy in giving me uh, notice of it, and actually for the thoroughness and care with which she has characteristically uh, approached this matter. He clearly is going into the detail uh, carefully uh, and in a measured fashion, which is the right approach. And I congratulate and welcome uh, the Shadow Secretary of State to her post uh, too. The Secretary of State has accepted the need for an independent element, and the Justice Committee has more than once referred to the need to avoid the prison service marking its own homework. Yes. Will he bear in mind in that regard uh, the uh, work that's already been done by Her Majesty's uh, Chief Inspectors of Prison and Probation? Uh, in relation to Wandsworth and other prisons, they have real expertise, and I hope he will avail himself of those. And secondly, in relation to his wider uh, inquiry into the relations of prison situation, on the face of it, when there has been a significant improvement in gate security, the failure of gate security on this occasion is all the more alarming. It's a matter of record uh, that there is an issue with staffing at Wandsworth and that there is an issue across the prison service with retaining experienced staff we have a large number of comparatively inexperienced staff. Evidence submitted to the Justice Committee's inquiry on the prison workforce it demonstrates concern at levels of training in some establishments. Will he make sure that those are fully taken on board as part of a serious review of prison workforce are on the back of this? State. Honourable Friend is absolutely right to draw attention to these matters. Now, as I've indicated, the inquiry must take its course and the issue of staffing will no doubt be considered. I, I, and necessarily, we can't go into a huge amount of detail. But what I can say is, of course, in all prisons, staff take on different roles. And on the specific issue of staffing at the security end of the prison, uh, the, the positions were staffed. The security posts were occupied. The question is, were the protocols applied and did people do what was expected uh, of them under those protocols? That is something that we need to get to the bottom of very urgently indeed. SNP spokesperson Richard Thompson. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for the advance sight of his statement and express views on, from my group that uh, Khalif has soon returned to custody. But leaving aside the quite extraordinary manner of the details of the escape, I think there are some more immediate questions which arise, which is uh, that uh, Mr Khalif may have been believed to pose a low risk to members of the public, but he was clearly considered to or thought to present a considerable potential risk to his service colleagues as well as to national security. So, as such, I think it will strike people as quite extraordinary that it was being held under Category B uh, prison conditions rather than Category A pending any trial. But what is uh, more extraordinary, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that prison inspectors reported concerns in January last year about uh, measures in place at Wandsworth to prevent escapes after finding what they believed to be potential shortcomings in physical aspects of security locally on site. And it was also quite alarming to hear the former head of security at Wandsworth, Ian Asherson, on the radio this morning, saying that on any given day, some 30 to 40 per cent of frontline staff are unavailable for duty at the prison. Now, the Prison Officers Association has highlighted that some £900 million has been stripped out of prison budgets in England and Wales since 2010, which is going to leave more prisons than just Wandsworth overcrowded and under-resourced. So could I ask the Minister, the Prison Officers Association's National Chair this morning has today called for an urgent review of how prisons across England and Wales are run. I appreciate that the Minister has announced two separate strands of inquiry from the dispatch box this morning, which I am sure will be welcomed, but will he expand the scope of his questioning to allow for that inquiry into how the prison service across England and Wales is run in light of these concerns which have been raised? Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I, can I deal with this second uh, point first? Because uh, prison officers do an extremely important job, and I will listen very carefully, of course, to what the Prison Officers Association has to say about this matter. I've already had a, a meeting, albeit predating this incident, as you might expect, uh, and that productive and constructive relationship uh, will continue. It, can I deal with this point about categorisation? Because I am very instinctively sympathetic to the point that he makes about why was he in a Category B estate, and that is precisely what I want to have some information about. But we do have to proceed with caution, because although we're not going to look at the specific, in the details of the specific offences, Section 58, Terrorism Act 2000, is an either way offence. There are other offences which are either way. It is not the case and has never been since the Terrorism Act of 2000 was created 23 years ago that everyone charged with Section 58 would be in the Cat A estate. Were that to happen, it would turn the whole system of categorisation on its head. I, I, it's, a, it's an offence I've prosecuted many times in the past, and so we do need to be ensure that we're looking at the detail of what he was charged with and the specific risk or otherwise that he may have presented. Uh, Mark Plett. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I echo entirely the Chair of the Select Committee's uh, comments about the tone and foreignness of the Lord Chancellor's statement, and in particular his commitment that no stone will be left unturned. And yet, the, stra the, the uh, presence of strapping on the underside of the vehicle would seem to indicate that there may have been some planning in, in, involved in this. And further to the Lord Chancellor's questions in regards to protocols and staffing arrangements, are there any implications that he may have had some assistance in this particular escape? Um, I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman. That there, um, I hope you won't take it as a discourtesy to say there is nothing that has occurred to him about lines of inquiry that hasn't, I can tell you, occurred to me, uh, to my ministerial colleagues, and indeed to members of HMPPS. All lines of inquiry are being considered, and all the ones that I'm sure around this House are occurring to members here. Dr. Vizena Alan Khan. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Local people in Tooting are alarmed that someone was able to escape from what is supposed to be an extremely secure prison. A few months ago, Madam Deputy Speaker, I raised the issue of low staffing levels with the Justice Secretary because I had concerns after speaking with local trade union, the Battersea and Wandsworth Trade Union Council. My parliamentary question revealed that, shockingly, only seven prison officers turned up for a night shift last December to cover 1,500 inmates. It's unworkable and unsafe. Staff are having to do double shifts with officers facing violence, abuse and struggling with their mental health. This makes staff retention impossible. In these circumstances, undoubtedly mistakes like this will happen. Since I raised the alarm many months ago, can the Secretary of State list the meetings he has held with the prison leadership? 
Can the Secretary of State also tell us what the average number of staff is per shift at Wandsworth Prison and the number of staff forced to take payment plus overtime shifts? Sadly, Madam Deputy Speaker, this isn't the only significant challenge the prisoners faced recently. In November, they were without water for six days. Prisoners, prisoners couldn't wash and had to rely on bottled water. This is an endemic problem throughout our public services due to 13 years of Tory mismanagement. School buildings are crumbling, our prisons are overstretched and falling apart, our NHS is under-resourced. When will they get a grip and sort it out? I, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. She began by um, expressing the concern on behalf of her constituents. She's right uh, to raise that. I, I would in, invite uh, her and indeed uh, her constituents to consider the remarks from the Metropolitan Police, which is believed to be a low risk to the community, and that's important that we stress that in this House. On the issue of staffing, it is an overriding and overwhelming priority for me to increase numbers, and I'm pleased that the numbers are going up, and of course I want them to go up further, but it's positive, I think, to note that uh, since the 30th of June 2023, there has been an increase of over 700 full-time equivalent, that's band three to band five, so wing officers uh, up to CMs, up to custody, uh, custody managers. That is positive. We have further to go, I entirely accept. But what is also encouraging is that if you look at the resignation rate, that is coming down. So I don't suggest for a second that the work is completed. It's not, and it's perfectly fair for her to raise those points, uh, but we are moving in the right direction. And then the third point, because I, I do think uh, that this can properly be uh, stressed, the early indications, the preliminary indications subject to the investigations that I've uh, ordered, are that the security posts were manned in Wandsworth at the time of this incident. So now we need to know, they having been manned, what went wrong. Scott Benton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I welcome the assurances provided by the Secretary of State in relation to the investigations which will now follow. Is he able to update the House on what steps the Government is taking to increase security across the prison estate as part of his Department's £4 billion investment to increase the number of prison places? Well, I'm grateful, grateful to my honourable friend. It, it's worth stepping back and reflecting for a second that the programme of infrastructure investment in the prisons is the second only in government to HS2. A huge amount of investment is going into our prisons, and I've seen what that can implement. I've been to HMP Five Wells, I've been to Foss Way, Millsyke is under construction. These are modern, safe, secure, decent, rehabilitative prisons. But on the specific point he raises about security, in addition, we have put in uh, forgive me, as part of that overall scheme, we have put in £100 million into enhanced gate security, also X ray scanners which can check for uh, illegally concealed contraband. That is driving up seizures and driving down violence in prisons. Of course, there is more to do, but that investment is yielding really significant results. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I wondered whether the Secretary of State was surprised that Daniel Calafay. Uh, was allowed to work in the kitchens, a role that I understand is really for trusted inmates. Very grateful Secretary to the Honourable Lady. That is precisely a question that has occurred to me and that is precisely what I want to have answers on. Uh, I would hope and expect by the end of this week, but certainly in very short order. Sarah Olney. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. This escape is incredibly serious. It uh, leaves many questions unanswered. Um, it was reported by the Metropolitan Police on social media yesterday that the escape prisoner has links to Kingston. Now, my constituents and the constituents of my right honourable friend, the member for Kingston and Surbiti, will naturally be Surbiton, will naturally be very concerned. I appreciate that the Secretary of State will be limited uh, in what he can say. Uh, in relation to the operation to apprehend the prisoner, but I'd be grateful for any statement he can make that would provide reassurance to my constituents and residents across South West London. Secretary of State. Very grateful to the uh, Honourable Lady for raising those points on behalf of her constituents. Uh, we all have a duty which um, sh she will uphold, as well as anyone else, to ensure that people aren't alarmed. And I would invite her to, um, and indeed her attention and that of her constituents, the remarks made by the Metropolitan Police. Yes, he shouldn't be approached, but he's considered to be low risk and not a larger risk to the wider public. Uh, Barry Sherman. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I remind the uh, Justice Secretary that uh, this is a very serious incident. Uh, any prison escape is serious. 
but we should put it in perspective. I can remember before, when he was very young, and even I, before I was a shadow prison and police, policing minister, um, can remember, but remember back in 1966, one of the most notorious skies, uh, spies and traitors, George Blake, escaped from Wormwood Scrubs. Absolutely startling and, 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 and disgraceful uh, lapse of security. And he finished his days living to his in the mid-90s in Moscow. In the present circumstances, yes, there should be a, a thorough inquiry, but yes, all of us interested in the justice system knows prison overcrowding is a serious problem and the excellent men and women of work in our prisons are under tremendous stress. And please, let's, this is a serious incident. I hope the guy gets ca captured quickly but the fact, and, and, and faces real justice, but can we please do something about the prison estate and the good people that man it. Secretary of State. I agree with all of his remarks. I, you know, one of the things that is so important is every prisons minister, every Secretary of State, whether they're Labour or Conservative, will say, don't they do a wonderful uh, job and it's a hidden service. I believe that to my bootstraps, and that's why I was up meeting the unlocked graduates in Leeds, to thank them personally for what they do. And that's why uh, we hosted a reception recently uh, in number 10, because it is an incredibly important job, and it's beyond, I dare say, most of the people in this room, if I may make so bold, it requires huge judgment, huge courage, huge yeah. integrity, huge decency, and I pay tribute yeah, to yeah, all yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Claire Anderson. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, along with other residents in South West London, my constituents in Putney are concerned about this incident, and I, I welcome the actions by the police, and I'm sure he will be swiftly detained. I visited Wandsworth Prison in June, and as I was arriving, six members of staff were being taken to A&E because they'd just been assaulted. Levels of staff shortages um, and inadequate staff training have been raised by prison, prison officers union um, to myself and others for a long time. I welcome the minister's inquiries. I welcome the fact that the, the points where the person absconded were being staffed. However, I hope that the minister will still look into the low levels of staffing shortages in Wandsworth and the inadequate staff training that is being raised by prison mm -hmm. officers, who, I agree with the Minister, do a fantastic job, but in very, very difficult circumstances in Wandsworth, which is a very overcrowded prison. Yeah. Yeah. Stay. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for raising those points. She's right about staffing and we need to, to drive it up. But as I indicated, the things that we have done which make a meaningful difference, and I was down at HMP ISA speaking to a band three officer about precisely this, rolling out body-worn video across the estate, because it's an incredibly important tool to dial down potentially volatile situations and, if they're not dialed down, to capture the evidence to ensure that justice is done. That is making an, an enormous difference to help bring down violence. But also, if you then look at the impact that it has on recruitment and Attention, the resignation rate is going down, the numbers we're recruiting are going up. So the points she makes as in principle are fair, but equally in that spirit of fairness, I think it's also important to note that there are some pos very positive trends that we will build on and develop further. Yeah. Andrew Gwynne. Thank you. Can I thank the Lord Chancellor for the statement and the update that he's given to the House this morning? Uh, he may well have seen the media speculation uh, that Khalife was missing for around an hour before prison staff uh, noticed. Uh, is that correct? And if it is, uh, what reassurances can he give that procedures will be tightened up, not just in this uh, particular prison, but across the estate? Thank you, Honourable Gentleman. It's one of the very issues that is being, is being looked into urgently. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister very much for his response? It's very obvious from the Minister's response that he has taken this issue very seriously uh, and the response that he comes forward as Minister will be one that we will all welcome. I understand the tremendous pressure which our prison service is under. However, can the Minister confirm that the decision to hold this man from a scene in a low security prison after previous escapes from uh, his other one it is not to do with space or pressure but rather an assessment which has turned out to be severely flawed? Uh, what is needed is uh, um, uh, um, a review of the procedure that has been used urgently. And can I also ask the Minister, is it possible to share the uh, findings of the inquiry that will take place with the other administrations, for instance, the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Policing and Justice Minister? Thank you. Uh, uh, can I thank the Honourable Gentleman? He asks a really uh, probing and important p point, if I may say so. So, the decision about where he was held was based upon 
an assessment of the circumstances relating to that individual and the alleged offending, not about whether there was space in the category A state. There's space to put in there if that would have been the right assessment. But what we have to get to the bottom of was, was that exercise properly conducted? And that's one of the reviews. To, 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 to his uh, second point about whether it can be shared, my strong instinct would be whatever can be shared should be, so that across the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, that any learning uh, can indeed be absorbed uh, as broadly as possible. Uh, I thank the Lord Chancellor uh, for his statement, and we now come to statement from the Home Secretary. Statement. With permission, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to make a statement about the PREVENT programme. Madam Deputy Speaker, the terrorist threat to the UK is unrelenting and evolving, and as I noted earlier this year announcing our refresh of contest, it is rising. To combat this, the tools to counter terrorism must evolve. Contest, our counter terrorism strategy has four pillars prevent, pursue, protect, and prepare. PREVENT aims to stop people becoming involved in terrorism by tackling radicalising ideologies at their root. It is an early intervention programme that relies on frontline public services across society, including healthcare, education, local authorities, the police and civil society. I am delivering wide-ranging reforms, Madam Deputy Speaker, following the reappraisal of its effectiveness by the independent review of PREVENT Sir William Shawcross. Prevent needs to better understand the threats we face and the ideology underpinning them. Ideology is the lens through which terrorists see the world. Our agencies work closely with leading experts, practitioners and former extremists. They all say that ideology is pivotal. Terrorism is fundamentally an attack on our ideas and freedoms, and so we must attack the threat at its source and disrupt those who seed and spread extremist ideology. Nonviolent extremism can, can certainly lead to violence, but it's a problem even where it does not. It undermines our values, it divides communities by diluting our sense of shared belonging. That is why I've been so disturbed by the sorts of incidents we've seen recently in Batley, Wakefield and elsewhere. We do not have blasphemy laws in Great Britain, and we must never succumb to their de facto imposition by a mob. Individuals under the Prevent Duty must challenge those who enable permissive environments for radicalisation, where grievances, identity politics and disinformation are used to whip up fear and division. Six months on from the publication of the Independent Review of Prevent, I am pleased to report significant progress to the House. We are on track to deliver our commitment to implement each of the independent review's recommendations in full. And so far, working closely with the Security Minister, we have completed 10 out of 34 recommendations and 68 out of the 120 tasks. I expect to have implemented at least 29 of the 34 recommendations a year on from the review's publication and the rest shortly thereafter. Today, I am publishing the first major revision of the Prevent Duty guidance since its introduction in 2015, and subject to the approval of Parliament, it will come into force on the 31st of December this year. The guidance is the key text underpinning how Prevent is delivered by the range of partners most central to its success. The changes reflect the spirit and the detail of Sir William's recommendations. I accepted the IRP's recommendation to reset thresholds to ensure proportionality across all extremist ideologies. RICU, the Research, Information and Communications Unit, which provides analytical and analysis products on behalf of the Home Office, was identified by Sir William as a concern. In the past, RICU has failed to draw clear distinctions between mainstream conservative commentary and the extreme right. People like my right honourable friend, the member for North East Somerset, and Douglas Murray, 
express mainstream, insightful and perfectly decent political views. People may disagree with them, but in no way are they extremists. Prevent must not risk any perception of disparaging them as such again. From now on, all Riku products which report on extremist trends and in future themes in, and in future themes will clearly state the purpose of such reporting and be proportionate. Our new prevent duty training available on gov.uk will highlight the importance of ideology and enhance understanding of the drivers of Islamist and extreme right wing terrorism. We will pilot and roll out new face-to-face -face training alongside this new guidance so that organisations across the sector have the appropriate skills to spot genuine radicalisation. And a new security threat check ensures that strategic decision-making related to prevent is informed by the current threat landscape, local threats, and that activity is directed accordingly. Mr. Speak Madam Deputy Speaker, the independent review recommended great care over terminology. The term susceptibility to radicalisation should be used where appropriate and vulnerability only where necessary. Many people who embrace extremism are affected by a range of complicating factors in their lives, but there is almost always an element of personal decision making in the choices they make. This must not be absolved, they must not be absolved of responsibility when they choose this path. I've also strengthened the operational delivery of PREVENT by switching to a regional delivery model that provides support for all local authorities across England and Wales. The top 20 areas in England and Wales with the highest risk ratings will receive multi-year funding. And I've also provided Home Office PREVENT expertise to Scotland. It is vital that PREVENT does nothing actively to undermine its mission, such as by supporting groups which work against the freedom and values that we stand for. So due diligence checks on partners delivering PREVENT in local communities have been strengthened, following input from the Commission for Countering Extremism and the Department for Levelling Up. PREVENT and public authorities like the police should not fund or work with those who legitimise extremism such as CAGE or MEND. That is completely at odds with PREVENT objectives. Extremist and anti-PREVENT groups have waged, have waged mendacious and malicious campaigns to try and discredit PREVENT as anti-Muslim to undermine its work. And, through, and so, through the work of a new specialist rapid rebuttal unit, we are now working to rapidly rebut and counter inaccurate information about PREVENT when it appears. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Independent Review found that PREVENT had not taken anti-Semitism seriously enough. So specialist intervention providers have now been recruited to better address the prevalence of anti-Semitism within those referred to PREVENT. They will work directly with those susceptible to radicalisation to deconstruct their extremist mindset and tackle it head on. This approach is complemented by new research allowing PREVENT to explain the pernicious and often, often subtle indicators of anti-Semitism. Like any public service, PREVENT needs independent oversight, Madam Deputy Speaker. And so, I expect the new Standards and Compliance Unit to be operational and publicised online in early 2024. It will process complaints from both the public and practitioners and take instruction from ministers to conduct investigations and publish findings. The unit will be delivered by the Commission for Countering Extremism and be answerable to ministers on the Prevent Oversight Board, chaired by my right honourable friend, the Security Minister. Madam Deputy Speaker, extremists of whatever disposition, be they neo-Nazis or Islamists, must know that in our fight against them, we will never be hampered by doubt or cowed by fear. Ensuring that PREVENT is fit for purpose is critical to delivering that message and to winning that fight. And I commend this statement to the House. Uh, Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Home Secretary for her statement and also join with the Government in paying tribute to the work of our security services, our counter-terror police, also the myriad of different agencies, local communities, councils, education, who work on the PREVENT programme and all of those who work so hard to keep us safe. Extremists try to divide us and to undermine our democratic values and our respect for one another. Extremist ideologies are a stain on our society which feed on fear and vulnerabilities to promote hatred and violence. And we have seen appalling terror attacks, from the attacks on children in Manchester to Fishmongers Hall and from our own Joe Cox and David Amos. And the strong and determined response to extremism and terror threats and to threats to our national security, wherever they come from, is immensely important to our safety. Rightly, the contest strategy includes prevent, pursue, prepare and protect. And it's right, too, for the Home Secretary to update the House on the approach to extremism and to the prevent programme. <clears throat> but on a day when there are grave unanswered questions about how a terror suspect could possibly have escaped from prison before trial, hidden on the bottom of a food van. I am astonished that the Home Secretary has said nothing about prevent and prisons. At a time when we've got unanswered questions about how on earth the escape could have happened, and also about staffing levels, where there have been repeated warnings of 30% staff absences and shifts not being covered, when those staffing issues matter for PREVENT as well. The independent review of PREVENT highlighted what countless other reports have also warned about, the lack of sufficient action on de-radicalisation and PREVENT in our prisons. We literally have prisoners who are leaving prison more radicalised than when they went in. The independent review said on extremism-related training for staff, it became clear during the review that this training was further cancelled due to staff and resource shortages. I was further told that there have been delays to staff beginning prevent training and to extremist prisoners beginning rehabilitative programmes. These delays are attributed to staffing and resourcing questions. So the government has been warned repeatedly about this. And I am concerned about there being no lack, a lack, complete lack of reference to this in her statement. So please, can she tell us what action is being taken, is being done, and also what action is being taken for those due to be released from prison, deliberately released, as opposed to those who obviously have escaped, as well. The contest warned that four of the nine declared terrorist attacks were perpetrated since 2018 were perpetrated by serving or recently released prisoners and the joint inspectorate has warned just a few months ago there are not enough senior officials in place to oversee the 120 prisoners who have terror related convictions due to be released by next march again what de-radicalisation and prevent work have those 120 prisoners had in prison and what provisions are there in place in the community to make sure there is no risk to the public. We cannot afford any suggestion of failure between the Home Office and the Ministry of Justice to take national security threats in prison seriously. Uh, today also there has been a report, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, from the Borders Inspectorate, highly critical about failures on insider threats in the border force, which says organisational structures for the insider threat have been found to be confused with complex interrelationships and unclear lines of accountability. Can she tell us what action she is taking to deal with that insider threat? And there is also no mention of any action on online radicalisation or the use of AI. Online radicalisation was raised in the independent review. Generative AI, we know, raises further challenges and questions, and we have identified potential serious legal loopholes in the ability to take action against those who choose to use generative AI to try to radicalise people. What action is being taken on that? We've asked her about this before. Will she agree to Labour's proposal to tighten the law? The majority of extremist threats our security agencies deal with are Islamist extremists, followed by far-right extremists. There are also other warped ideologies that have, de that have driven violent threats. The main focus must continue to be on Islamist extremist threats, and I welcome the emphasis on anti-Semitism. But the agencies of police and the Prevent Programme need to follow the threats of violence and hateful extremism wherever the evidence goes and not have to follow any political hierarchies that have been set. Neil Basu, the former 
uh, counter-terror chief has said, we also need to make sure there is earlier intervention and prevention. If we set the bar for prevent so high, it can only deal with those already radicalised. We'll have more terrorists and not fewer. So can she finally tell me what action is being taken in response to the report some years ago on hateful extremism from the former Countering Extremism Commissioner? Is the government ever going to respond to that or to update the Countering Extremism strategy, which is now eight years out of date? We need the action on that. Prevent is not the whole of a countering extremism strategy. We need that broader action if we're to keep our democratic values safe. Yeah. Home Secretary. Well, I thank the Vital Lady for her response. And uh, she raised uh, several points to which I will, uh, I will also respond. First of all, uh, let me pay tribute to all of the professionals, the experts, the uh, those uh, in our agencies who work day and night to keep the British people safe from the evolving and changing and indeed increasing risk that we carry when it comes to terrorism. Uh, they work in many ways uh, that, uh, of which we will not be aware, but they put, make huge sacrifice. And I'm very proud of the progress that they have made and that this government has made in, in recent years, whether it be uh, the, uh, the, the opening of a new counter-terrorism operations centre up and running now to deliver state-of-the-art um, and coordinated counter-terrorism work amongst all of the agencies, be they the police and, uh, and others, working in one place in a coordinated and streamlined way. I was very pleased to visit CTOC very recently. Or whether it's the relaunch of our contest strategy, again, earlier this year. Or, or whether it's that since 2018, there have been 39 disrupted attacks by our brave men and women working in law enforcement and agencies. So that uh, huge amount of work uh, is something which is uh, you know, something going uh, incredibly well. Of course, the threat remains substantial, which means that an attack is likely. So there is no room for complacency when it comes to this issue, and that is why I am wholly committed to focusing on the, uh, the effective delivery of the recommendations set out by Sir William Shawcross, and this is why I've come uh, to the House today to update it. Um, the Right Honourable Lady mentioned uh, prisons, and of course William Shawcross referred to the threat of terrorism and extremism and radicalisation within the prison estate. In terms, in fact, recommendation 27 uh, of his report uh, makes uh, clear that better and more training is required for prison officers. And that's why I'm very pleased that the new terrorism risks behaviour profile, a new prison-based product uh, led by MOJ, building on actually more the recommendations uh, made by Jonathan Hall, uh, reiterated and uh, built on by Sir William, uh, have now made significant progress in their rollout and will be completed by the end of the year. The value that this new tool will bring is that prison officers will be better trained. They will have more skills, more tools at their disposal to better identify terrorism and the risk that it poses within the prison estate. And that is a direct response to recommendations and concerns that have been raised. Now, uh, I, I refer the Honourable Lady to the statement which has been, just been made by the Lord Chancellor on the broader issues. Um, and uh, I am receiving regular briefing on the circumstances leading to the escape of Daniel Khalif yesterday and on the uh, wide-ranging police operation um, actually uh, involving border force and uh, agencies on tracking him down currently. Um, the Right Honourable Lady also uh, mentioned the, uh, the resources. Uh, let's be clear, funding for counter-terrorism is as high as it's ever been, and prevent funding has not been cut. 
What we are doing, however, is ensuring the redirection of resources to better reflect the evolving threat picture, so that our resources are directed at the priorities as informed by the intelligence picture. For example, I'm very pleased that lo all local authorities now have a dedicated home office point of expertise and contact rolled out throughout England and Wales. That will properly equip those in the local authority sector to have at their disposal properly trained and uh, a connection, a, a dialogue, a meaningful relationship with the Home Office so that they can be better uh, tooled up to respond to radicalisation and risks relating to prevent in the community. She also mentioned uh, the uh, hierarchy and that there shouldn't be uh, a hierarchy of uh, threats. Well, of course, there is no such hierarchy. Uh, Prevent is ideologically agnostic. Uh, but uh, we must always be clear about the facts. The facts are that, uh, for example, when I last updated the House, 80% of counter-terrorism police networks' live investigations were uh, Islamist. Uh, MI5 are clear that Islamist terrorism remains our predominant threat, accounting for 75% of their caseload. And yet, only 16% of prevent referrals in 2021 were Islamist. That's a fundamental problem that Sir William identified and which I am addressing right now through these robust and wide-ranging reforms. Uh, the reality is that prevent, Madam Deputy Speaker, is a security service not a social service. And too often, the role of ideology in terrorism has been minimised, with violence attributed instead to vulnerabilities, such as mental health or to poverty, protective factors, rather than enforcing individual responsibility and personal agencies for the choice uh, that these people are making. I will and am implementing all of the review's recommendations. Uh, I committed to reporting back to the House on progress, but it is clear, I am clear, that Prevent must focus solely on security, not political correctness or appeasing campaign groups. Its first objective must be to tackle the ideological causes of terrorism. We will not be cowed by fear. We will not be hampered by doubt. And I'm very grateful to the House for hearing this update. Thank you. Sir Mike Penny. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I say to the Home Secretary, it's welcome that she's come to the House today to give us an update on the report. And I'm sure the whole House will be grateful that, and the country will be grateful that all of the recommendations have been accepted into the, the review. And she's absolutely right to say it's about individuals making individual choices and no excuses can be put in place as to their background or to the, the, the indoctrination that's been taking place. This is about freedom of speech as well. So people shouldn't be frightened that this is an intrusion into freedom of speech, but it is about the, the safety of this country from ter terrorism. Home Secretary. I, I couldn't agree more with my right honourable friend. He's absolutely right that this is about national security, this is about public safety, and this is about security. This is not about uh, uh, appeasing campaign groups. This is not about fear of offending particular minority groups. This is not about uh, putting community cohesion ahead of the interests of national security. I am absolutely clear that uh, our prevent professionals, but all of our agencies who work in this regard, must work without fear or favour and in the interests of national security first and foremost. SNP spokesperson Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Shawcross Review has found that the Prevent strategy has failed and lost its way. The very system aimed to identify would-be terrorists has allegedly funded a group whose head was sympathetic to the Taliban. And that failure is why the Home Secretary is coming to the House today to make a statement. So I'm sure she will agree that public confidence in the Prevent strategy has been shaken to its very foundations. And we know that those previously referred to the Prevent, uh, those previously referred to Prevent went on to, prevent, to commit terrorist acts and the terrorist threat 
um, across the UK remains substantial, which means that an attack is likely. Um, can the Se Home Secretary tell us um, what long-term work is being done to monitor uh, those who leave prison after serving sentences to ensure they don't, do not remain a threat to our communities and national security? Islamist terrorism is the primary terrorist threat, but it's not the only one. And it has to be welcomed that the Wagner Group is to be declared a terrorist organisation. But there must be ongoing concern and vigilance over extreme and far-right in-cell movements. And questions about how to tackle online radicalisation remain. Can the Home Secretary tell us Will she assure us that there will be full cooperation with the devolved nations as we seek to tackle the scourge of terrorism? And what guarantees will she provide that Prevent will have the necessary budget and resources to fulfil its central aim and its central mission of preventing terrorism across the UK? And finally, Madam Chair, um, the Home Secretary talked about better training for prison officers, but staffing crises in our prisons are rife. So training was whilst all well and good. It's important that when terrorists are convicted, the prison estate has the proper manpower levels to play their part when it comes to de-radicalising and rehabilitating those who have been convicted of terrorist offences so they can, when they're released, they can go back to the communities without, without causing alarm. So what action is she taking to address the staffing crisis in our prisons, which is part of this strategy? Well, the Honourable Lady talked about um, Home Office funding, historic Home Office funding of groups linked with extremism, an issue identified by Sir William in his landmark report and something that, frankly, appalled me uh, when I read that Prevent has historically funded groups that have legitimised extremism or has worked with groups whose values totally contradict our own. It's not a proper use of public money. It undermines, prevents objectives, and it is potentially a threat to national security. Uh, I will ensure that never happens again. And as a result of that issue identified in the report, uh, we are uh, running a full-scale audit of all of the uh, counter-extremism funding arrangements. Uh, we will immediately terminate all agreements which fall below our standards. And we are working closely with the Commission for Countering Extremism to ensure that we strengthen our oversight and vetting procedures to ensure that taxpayer money always goes to the right groups. Scott Benton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I welcome the Home Secretary's statement and her strong leadership on this issue. The additional measures taken by the MOJ earlier this year to crack down on the activities of terrorist prisoners were very much welcome. Is the Home Secretary able to provide an update on any assessments the Home Office in conjunction with the MOJ have completed on the success of these measures so far? Well, there, um, th there are uh, the prevent uh, duty uh, applies to those working in the prison estate, and Sir William did identify a particular concern relating to the threat of radicalisation and terrorism occurring and evolving within the prison estate, um, and that's why he made a recommendation. And I'm very pleased that we've made significant progress on rolling out the terrorism risks behaviour profile which will now enable uh, prison officers to have better training so they, they can better spot and they are more confident and knowledgeable about the signs of radicalisation, extremism and terrorism within the prison estate and thereafter that they, can, that they are empowered to take steps to mitigate and eliminate that risk. Chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, in ensuring Prevent is fit for purpose, when the Home Affairs Select Committee looked at the Prevent review, we were concerned about the underrepresentation of the Islamist threat in Prevent referrals compared to that of uh, right-wing extremism referrals. And out of 4,915 referrals, 22% related to Islamist radicalisation and 25% related to extreme right-wing. 
Uh, but those who actually ended up on remand for terrorist offences, 70% were categorised as Islamist and 22% for extreme right wing. The security minister, when he appeared in front of us, said they needed to look at the reasons for this and that they were going to, to look at the misallocation and seek to make uh, sure it better represented uh, the actual threat. So can the, secretary, uh, can the Home Secretary just set out what work has been done to ensure that there is that proper uh, representation in those initial prevent referrals? Well, it's exactly that uh, incongruity and disparity between the, the intelligence pic picture and the security threat picture and what was happening on the ground uh, amongst the prevent community in terms of the referrals of, uh, that they were making. And the uh, disparity uh, was, w it, it, it is a problem. So that is why today marks a, an important step forward in rectifying that erroneous approach. The new statutory guidance will focus uh, increasingly on ideological causes of terrorism and there will be much more stringency and robustness in looking uh, more rigorously at the ideology behind the extremism. But importantly, we're also adopting Sir William's recommendation of including the security threat check. Now that consists of specialist questions which are directly informed from the, by the intelligence and uh, home office analysis on s the security and CT picture. And that uh, will form a series of principles which will help ensure that prevent referrals on the ground properly reflect the, the, the threat picture. Uh, Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. Coming from Greater Manchester as I do, uh, I know uh, tragically what the end result of Islamist um, indoctrination uh, can have on a community. So I welcome very much the uh, re-emphasis of tackling uh, Islamist indoctrination. Can I ask her though, in her reset of the PREVENT um, system, that um, she explains to the House how she is going to take uh, local communities with her. She knows one of the criticisms of the PREVENT system as it currently stands is that it uh, also stigmatises whole communities and not just those who are extremists. So can she say what confidence she's going to give to diverse communities across the United Kingdom? Well. Um, it is not right to say that PREVENT is anti-Muslim. Um, PREVENT is about ensuring that um, Islamism, extremism, radicalisation, violent ideology about hatred and evil and values totally at odds with our own is stamped out. And the vast majority of British Muslims make a valuable contribution to the United Kingdom. But we must be brave and courageous in calling out permissive environments, in calling out uh, tolerance for extremism amongst some parts of our community. That requires a fearless approach, one that is not cowed by political correctness, fear of upsetting particular groups in the name of community cohesion. If we want to save lives, we need to take a united approach, but a robust one, a fearless approach to calling out Islamism when we see it. Tim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I very much uh, thank the Secretary of State for her statement and for the strength of character and delivery of, of purpose as well. Uh, the, the Secretary of State mentioned in her, her statement today she referred to uh, discussions and perhaps support with Scotland. The Secretary of State is right to be strong on radicalisation and steps to be taken to combat this. In Northern Ireland, the rewriting of history is leading to the glorification of terrorism uh, to a new generation and must be combated. So will the Secretary of State or can the Secretary of State confirm the effectiveness of uh, prevent in, in all areas of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Thank you so much. Home Secretary. Well, we are seeing and this is something I mentioned in, uh, when, when we refreshed our contest strategy, uh, a concerning level of uh, terrorism related to Northern Ireland. And this is a very sorry reflection 
of behaviour, unacceptable behaviour that must be condemned in the strongest possible terms. Our agencies work UK-wide uh, and we are, are always working closely with the uh, PSNI and other authorities at the local level to ensure that all leads are followed in the fullest possible way, measures are put in place to mitigate risks as they emerge, but as we saw earlier this year, uh, this threat is a concern and we must remain vigilant to it. I thank the Home Secretary for her uh, statement and we now have a statement from the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is a momentous day for British science and technology as we negotiated a great landmark deal designed in the UK's best interests, a hard fought for deal that will allow the UK's world-leading scientists, researchers and businesses to participate with total confidence in both Horizon Europe and Copernicus. Yeah, yeah. It gives the best and the brightest of the UK's scientific community access to the world's largest research collaboration programme. It means that British scientists and businesses can cooperate with researchers not just in the EU, but also Norway, New Zealand and Israel, expanding the reach and the impact of British science and technology to every corner of the globe. And with Korea and Canada looking to join these programmes in the future, we are opening the doors to further pioneering international collaboration with a growing group of countries. We were always clear that we wanted to associate